Hi everyone, and welcome back to The Rush. My next guest, Chris Nicola, he's done an amazing documentary that is in town for the Vancouver Jewish Film Festival. He's an explorer and also the founder of the Priest Grotto Heritage Project, and he's here to tell us all about his very interesting and varied career. Chris, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. You have done so many things uh, in your life, uh, and being an explorer is one of them, and it's what brought you here today and to this documentary. Uh, when did you start exploring caves? How did you start doing this? Uh, well, in the, um, in the mid-70s, I moved from New York City down to Washington, D.C., and one of the first things I did was I became a certified scuba diver, and my dive club used to spend a lot of time uh, in Gainesville, down in the uh, Florida section where there are underwater caves. So my first caves were underwater caves, and I just became amazed. And uh, subsequently, though, I moved back to New York in uh, the late 80s, and the distances were so great, so I gave up wet caving, which is what you call cave Scuba diving, diving yeah. and I became a dry caver. And that's uh, just basically when people go spelunking, is that what dry caving is? Uh, spelunking can be referred to both cave diving and uh, dry caving, but uh, it's mostly a European term. For some reason, American cavers like to be called cavers rather than spelunkers. And why were you so fascinated with caves? Well, I, I think it's because I've always been a, a puzzle solver. And someone recently called me as saying that you can compare caving to an underground Rubik's Cube. It's a mystery. And I think it's the adrenaline rush. Um, there's always the chance that when you're caving, you may make a left-hand turn instead of a right-hand turn, as others have made for hundreds of years, and discover new passage. Or you may be the first one to lift that rock out of your way. And in so doing, discover a new life form or a long-lost life form. And occasionally you hear the stories about uh, fortunes or gold or buried yeah. treasure or a gem. So this is a gem in a story that the documentary No Place on Earth is about. And uh, you were in the Ukraine and you went to a cave that had previously been discovered. But what did you find there that made you decide that you wanted to research uh, more about the situation? Well, although I originally went there to study the geology and uh, the cave, uh, I immediately uh, became uh, fixated on some artifacts that I found, not too far from the entrance of the cave. Um, a woman's shoe, you know, or a small child's shoe, uh, buttons, remnants of clothing, um, indications that people had dug earthen trenches to use uh, to sit down and uh, make earthen tables. So I, I knew that whoever was there was there for a long term. This wasn't something that was done over a weekend, and I had to find out who left those artifacts there. Uh, and that became a, a nine-year challenge uh, to investigate this rumor that I heard from local farmers in Ukraine that perhaps some Jews lived in a cave. That's all I had to go on. And it took nine years, and as uh, you'll find out uh, when you see the documentary, after nine years, I found a survivor living uh, not far from me in New York City. And what a he, small world we live in. And he confirmed that he and 37 friends and relatives survived the Holocaust by living underground for almost a year. And I know a lot of people obviously have studied the Holocaust. I'd never heard of, of these survivors in the Ukraine. Is this the first time people had happened upon, and actually, obviously there are survivors, but actually told this whole story? Well, one, one of the uh, first questions I asked the survivors when I met them in uh, 2003 was, uh, basically, I said, I have to ask you a question that's being asked of me every time I approach somebody about getting involved in a project. If this story is true, how come nobody heard of it? Yeah. And uh, what Sal Sturmer, who's featured in a documentary, said to me at that point, he told me to speak to his granddaughter who was sitting next to him about how he went to her class when she was eight years old. Erin, uh, who's also featured in a documentary, used to tell her classmates about the escapades of her grandfather and others, and the kids in her class used to tease her. So one day, when she was eight years old, she finally convinced her grandfather, Saul, to go to her school. He did that. He told the story. And the next day, the kids teased her twice as much for having a crazy old grandfather with a vivid imagination. So, so people thought this story seemed so unbelievable. Well, Saul Sturmer told me, he said, our fellow Jews, knowing the statistics of survival was so low in that particular area, they couldn't believe the story. So metaphorically, the story lay buried for over six decades until the Sturmers um, had enough faith in Jan Tobias, the director, 
Peter Lane Taylor, the co-author of uh, Secret Free Scrottle that I wrote with him, until they had enough confidence in us to quote them, to tell the story they couldn't tell for themselves. And that's always been a gift that the three of us have taken away from with this project. And such an important story to be told. I mean, there's so many stories of Holocaust survivors hiding from the Nazis, but how long were these people in these underground caves? Well, it's the longest known case of uninterrupted underground survival, sustained survival. Uh, 344 days in the case of uh, the women and the children. Now, each of the five families had uh, one male ranging in age from 15 to 21, and I call them the breadwinners in my book. And every five or six weeks, these males, under cover of darkness, will go out, they would scrounge for food, uh, knowing two things. They had to get back before the sun rose, and whatever they brought in would last five to six weeks. But with the exception of those five to six breadwinners, everyone else stayed in the cave for 344 days, and they ranged in age from two years old to 76. An amazing story, and it is part of the Vancouver Jewish Film Festival. Let's have a look at a clip from No Place on Earth right now. I kept coming back to Ukraine every year, hoping to uncover the story of the people who had lived in the cave. Western Ukraine was one of the worst places for Jews during the war. Less than 5% survived here. 1.5 million Jews were executed without going to the camps. It was a personal extermination. I figured that if a group of Jews had lived in the cave, they were probably no survivors. Such an amazing story. What was it like for you to meet and talk to these survivors and get their story? Oh, this was a piece of living history. It was amazing. And especially getting the opportunity to walk around in the caves with them. Now, that is incredible to me uh, that they, it must have been so emotional for them and you to do this. What was it like bringing these survivors back to the caves? Because they, quite elderly, uh, actually went down. We've got some footage from the documentary rolling right now, but what was this like for you to take them back to where they hid from the Nazis? Well, well, well keep in mind, they went into the cave originally and not equipped. Um, they taught themselves through trial and error, thinking out of the box. They taught themselves to be world-class cavers. And here we are almost seven decades later, and they reverted back to what they learned 70 years ago. They became cavers again. And... Um, Walking them around the cave, I, I couldn't help thinking of the way they were seeing things. I felt like I was going back in time, uh, especially with Saul Sturm. I felt like he was seeing things exactly the way they were 70 years ago. And in the case of his younger brother, he was such on an energy high. Now, here's somebody in the 80s that was literally pulling me through the cave. Really? Uh, so, uh, and in the case of the nieces, again, uh, I, I took this as a gift to see the cave through their eyes the way they saw it 70 years ago. I, I almost felt like I was going back in time. Did you reconnect them with the artifacts, uh, their belongings? Did you match them up to anyone who's still around? Uh, it was a little difficult to get specific artifacts, but I remember at one point I brought out a piece of wood and I showed it to Sal Sturmer, the master of one-liners, and I said, is this wood of any significance? And he said, I'll tell you what you found. He found a piece of muddy old wood that's rotting in the ground. <laughs> and I said, well, look at it a little closer. And he looked at it and he said, oh my goodness, this is the beam from the bed I built for our family. Wow. And it brought back memories and tears came to his eyes. How far, I mean, we were looking at footage of the cave that you took them back to. How far down was it? Obviously, you had to be lowered into it, but how did they get in and out? Well, you have to understand that the original entrance collapsed many years ago due to uh, mudslides. Uh, mostly uh, in the spring, because what happens is snow melt. So the original entrance has been closed for years. In the early 60s, local Ukrainian cavers saw an unusual drainage pan of water midway up the sinkhole, and they dug a shaft down. So the shaft is 30 feet deep, two and a half feet wide, and then it's followed by a 90-foot stoop crawl, where you have to walk in water six inches, 90 feet, and then the cave opens up. So today's entrance is much more challenging than what they went through. 
So it's not an easy cave to get into. And here they are in the 80s and 90s, and they tried. Uh, what is the Priest Grotto Heritage Project? Well, uh, in 2006, with the help of uh, one of the grandchildren of the survivors, Cliff Sturmer, uh, we approached the local museum in Borshev, Ukraine, and um, we worked uh, out a program where we would help them, meaning our cave foundation here, uh, we'll give them money to assist them, and this was their idea, to build an exhibit in a museum to honor what these 38 courageous Jews did. But the condition that I, that our organization placed in the local museum was, you had to take a portion of the money and train some of the youngsters in the area, and there are no Jewish youngsters in the area, to be young archaeologists to help them find, preserve the artifacts and build the exhibit. So, in short, and I'm very careful the way I, I phrase this, we now have a project where we had the grandchildren and great-grandchildren, the dolls that lived in the cave, working with the grandchildren and great-grandchildren and those that lived above the cave to build this exhibit. Wow. So it's a genocide awareness pro program. That's fantastic, and what an amazing story. Thank you so much for joining me today. You have to see this documentary. It's absolutely uh, an incredible story of survival. It's called No Place on Earth, and it's showing at 1 o'clock on November the 11th at the Fifth Avenue Theater, and you can find out more by going to the website for the Vancouver Jewish Film Festival at vjff.org. We're going to take a break and return with more for you on The Rush right after this. Stay tuned.